Well, I, I think basically historically, uh, I would say that University of Ibadan has had the privilege of history um, and the benefit of a traditions and culture of, of learning and uh, with a solid structure uh, built over time uh, that has become like a buffer. And uh, if you were talking about decline, you probably want to say that it has declined slower, much, much uh, slower than the uh, contemporary universities elsewhere uh, because of this uh, kind of traditions. But in terms of re relative standards, it's probably not fair to compare University of Ibadan with uh, other universities in Nigeria. Um, but University of Ibadan's comparison should be with universities outside Nigeria. Sometimes when we talk about falling standards, it's not really that standards are falling in the way in which we understand standards are falling. It's just that the world is growing at a faster pace and technology is growing at a faster pace than our universities are able to catch. Yes, you know, so we are left behind. So you, you see knowledge is growing geometrically, but we are growing incrementally, much slower, and uh, which means that except there is a quantum leap, uh, we have that paradigm shift. It's not quite likely that we will ever get to the point where we can really catalyze the kind of uh, changes that uh, we expect that universities should make in society. We are a pre-industrial society uh, where, where we can say that Europe and America are in, are in the knowledge age. The education system that we are still practicing in Nigeria today is for the industrial. It's not even for the knowledge society. So we are, by the time Ibadan was established in 1948, the UK itself was already transforming and moving away from the model that we were established in, 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 in UI. Because you look at the colonial structure, the mentalities that a colonial university confers on learning, on behavior, also persist. So these are some of the critical uh, issues that uh, you will have to consider in looking at that uh, uh, issue. But when people move from the university system to, uh, so from the outside community to the Nigerian university system, they move vertically. So you step up into the university community. It's an artificial community. It has no bearing with what happens within the society. We create it, we feed it, we sustain it with a lot of resources because the society is much lower in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, the, the knowledge uh, systems that uh, are propagated, in terms of uh, the mentalities. Look at the economy. In the systems that we're talking about, the economists are there to sustain the whole idea of knowledge, a knowledge enterprise. The question I ask is, which kind of economy do we have that can sustain the university knowledge enterprise in Nigeria? So when you talk about the, uh, the business, you talk about we are not producing students for the business environment. The question I ask people is that, where are the knowledge-based business uh, enterprises in Nigeria? Where are the companies that we absorb these students? Where are these companies that are complaining that we are producing students who are not, uh, who are not relevant, who are, un who are unemployable? The, the businesses are not there. Employment in Nigeria is driven by nepotism. So when you now say, for instance, students are unemployable, of course, if you, if you do not follow the right parameters to employ people, you get incompetent people, you have no right to complain. father complained about my mother's generation that standards of education were, were, were poor. My mother complained about my generation. I am complaining about my children's generation. When you deal with the population that the country has to deal with now and the resources per capita that you will need to invest on an individual to get him educated, we are dealing with just a, a, a couple of elite and we are taking an, a, a substantial amount of the nation's wealth to be trained. And then you have to say what kind of training were they getting? They were getting training that will serve a colonial economy, mm -hmm. that will serve colonial mentalities. They were getting trainings, for instance, that were, 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 were disconnected them from the realities of their people, and uh, creating deluded hybrids. Mm -hmm. Now, if these people were that successful, why is our nation this way? If the university system produced the kind of caliber of human, human beings that should transform a nation, why are we still uh, uh, tottering on the brink of collapse at this generation? Which means that our university is fundamentally failed in dealing with the, the critical elements that a university should develop. First of all, establishing the, the basis of society, of a, of, a, of a society that works, 
we have failed on that. Our resources is not growing with the population, uh, in terms of the population we are dealing with. So we are spending less on education, and so we are giving uh, less quality to the majority. But there is still a minority of Nigerians who are getting the right kinds of education, uh, who are getting quality education, although expensive. These are the elites. So the public infrastructure, the public education system have virtually collapsed. So we are feeding in both the, the, these individuals who are well trained and the poor individuals who are going through the public system into the same pipeline. Increasingly, there is in fact a reduction in terms of the population, in terms of the, 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 the equity, in terms of the educational system. So that we are beginning to see an emerging segregated educational system where if you are poor, uh, you will end up uh, in going through uh, a different learning pathway. Maybe you will end up in a college of education or you will end up in a polytechnic. But if you, are, if you are rich, you end up in the public university and then you are subsidized by government. And if you are the very, very poor, you end up with the distance learning program or the part-time programs. This is what we are, if we continue like this, in the next uh, 15, 20 years, we will see a clearly segregated society where if you are born into poverty, there will be no opportunity for you to get out of it. You see, leadership. Uh, you know, it's a very it's a vicious cycle. In fact, uh, uh, it will take maybe a very long time to analyze what is going on, but I'll try to make it uh, very uh, brief. The problem is that there's, there's what is called the law of exponential decay. When you have an incompetent leader, uh, the, the effect of, incompet of his incompetence does not just affect him. It affects the system. But when you have a bad teacher, especially in a system that can, off, can only hire and not fire, what you end up is that it affects the whole generation. And the generation affects other generations so that you can talk about a lifetime of incompetence that a teacher we create. It's even worse for administrators. So that's basically one of the problems that we have in the system. The second problem is the external issue of resource control. There is so much competition now uh, for resource control that the university environment is now interpreted as, a, as, a, as, look, as resources that are allocated to different states. So if you have a federal institution in a place, the Owners of the, 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 the state, people in the state believe that it is part of their national cake. And so it does not matter. They have to attain and assume leadership of those institutions. It doesn't matter whether they have the, what it takes or not. It's even getting worse now. It's no longer just a case of, a, of a, the, the state or the ethnic group. It's now locationalization. So the people, the locality, are now also demanding for leadership because they see it as part of their own national cake. When somebody is starving and you feed the person, you give the person food, the tendency of sometimes is to overgorge himself. Many institutions had leaders or the institutions themselves had no capacity to spend. The federal government intervention between 2012 and 2015 itself created an enormous problem for the institution. There was overfunding. Excess funds were, were, were pumped into the institutions with many institutions lacking capacity to spend. It does not just mean that they don't have something to spend money on, but they cannot manage resources effectively. And then you saw vice chancellors who saw money and went crazy and began to appropriate university resources for themselves because many of them were politically connected. And if you look at that administration at that time, you know, it's there was a simply an orgy of corruption under that administration at that time. And that also affected the, the university system. That the kind of corruption, the scale of it, it's not as if there has not been corruption within the system, but the scale of corruption within the system itself, within that period, was, is unprecedented. And until the federal government sets up a visitation team to look at what has happened in the nation within that period we are talking about, you, you, you we will not get to the root of it because it is much more than the kind of things we are talking about now in terms of the scale of corruption. Now we are even, th look, let's even move away from uh, the issue of corruption in terms of uh, people embezzling funds. What about the contract, contracts that were awarded
for projects that were not needed, over invoicing that became the, the norm, uh, you know, blatant uh, uh, sh sh sharing of loot, inducements within the system. And in fact, some, some institutions will go as far as even, even uh, trying to, to, to induce all the workers by some kind of frivolous allowances that are not provided for within the, uh, within the uh, government uh, 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 permitted allowances. Now, I, I believe that one of the ways we are, we are approaching the whole business of running higher education is the command and control kind of approach. It's not going to work. I feel that there is still a need to define new parameters for funding of uh, higher education institutions. Now, what is happening presently is that institutions are expanding. There is even this whole business of uh, uh, some kind of contradictions that we are seeing. We are talking about an era where there is resource construction, enormous construction resources, yet if you go and look at the rate of expansion of institutions, it does not show that there is scarcity. New programs are being created. You, there, are, there is no restructuring of the, of the institutions. There is no reform of processes. There is no uh, modification of systems. Everything is as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Now, it does not show, for instance, that there, this is a thinking system. We have to go back and start to operate a thinking system. Now, the, in order for us to have the, 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 a more uh, accountable and transparent uh, uh, financial system, first of all, we must also ensure that students are empowered. We must ensure that, in other words, students should be able to determine a, a, a part of uh, the, 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 the criteria for those who teach them, their promotion and so on. There must be an evaluation system. We must establish evaluation parameters for every and every office within the institutions themselves so that people don't fail upwards. I'm not talking, they are failing upwards. A, a, the only reason a person gets qualified for a higher office is because he occupied a lower office, not because he was successful in that office. Now, government cannot just continue to give money to public institutions simply because they demanded for it. What you do basically is that establish the parameters for funding. You must use funding to catalyze uh, change. You must use it to catalyze. So if you find out that you want transparency and accountability, it should be part of the accreditation criteria. It should be part of the scoring for those uh, accreditation. And then, of course, until we empower the students, there will be no competition in the system. Until there is competition in the system, there will be no quality. We should define the baseline uh, amount of funds that we will give to universities or to the polytechnics and colleges of education to run based on efficiency criteria. Once we have done that, since the government is, is, insists that public universities must, ha must be tuition-free, which will allow students to go wherever they want to, whichever institutions they want to, and pay their fees, having determined exactly what it takes to train a student in a Nigerian university. Once the students have made their choice of university, pay their fees to those institutions. You know what will happen? Students overnight, it, it, will, shift, it will shift from a supply market to a demand market. They will, students will become king, and universities will start to woo students. Their system will change, because if you do not have students, you die. If students are empowered, we create a demand-side economy uh, in the education sector. And then, of course, we will now uh, be able to create the necessary uh, uh, environment where universities will have to start uh, uh, serving, change from their control mentality to a service mentality. And then, of course, that will improve uh, quality. Uh, all this other detecting quality, trying to impose quality by the kind of command and control this thing is not going to work. Believe me, I don't know. I, I, believe me, I don't know. Uh, that, that's just the truth about it. I don't know. And actually, I hope it is, this, the union is restored because it is in the interest of the institutions to have unionism, legitimate student unions. And, uh, but I also want to give an ad advice to students that 
they, they also have to raise their unionism to an intellectual level and in such a way that we cannot continue to use the logic of force. The force of argument must be restored. We, must continue to, we, now, we now must operate like intellectuals if we want to give any hope to this, to this nation, both at the level of the students, at the level of the intellectuals. But I can tell you that the intellectual community in Nigeria is a big disappointment. I, let, me just, let me just announce to you that uh, the governor of uh, Kogi State University just uh, yesterday banned ASU. Yes. In, uh, so it's, it's, uh, this is repression. And I don't think it's uh, a good sign when we eliminate legitimate space for students uh, to converge. And I'll give you the reason why. If you look at the history from the 1980s, Government assailed the ideologues, attacked the student union body in the university of, of uh, in universities all over the, the nation, destroyed the leadership, and what happened? They destroyed the intellectual space. Courtism went in, occupied the space, and for almost twenty years, we had to battle with courtism. And after that. The, uh, the, the, the a new leadership when we re, when re, there was a resurgence now of student unionism, since we had no culture and tradition of student unionism for a generation, new leadership emerged that saw student unionism as an opportunistic position. They found accommodation with the, the political class, and they became the new thugs that were hired for political brigandage, and it changed the face of student unionism, banning student unionism, student unions as a result of uh, protest, cannot be the solution to the problem of, uh, of uh, virulent uh, unionism. I think basically criminality should be dealt with when they arise. But it cannot be a whole outright wholesale banning of any legitimate gathering or union or association, whether academic union or whether uh, market union, whatever, I think it's a, it's a sign of repression. Welcome to Fossville Luxury Hotel. At Fossville Luxury Hotel, we offer excellent service. Our rooms have all the necessary facilities to make your stay comfortable and memorable. You will also have access to internet service, breakfast, 24-hour power supply, full air condition, free international calls, free time pumping service, and free car battery charge. So what are you waiting for? Quickly visit Fossville Luxury Hotel. We are located as number one at the Nirobar Michele off Raja Rasaki Road, First Estate, Amuwo, or the Fifesta Village. For more information or reservation, please call us on 080 75 78 7135 or 080 99 90 0601. You can also take advantage of our online ongoing promo at www.fossvhotel.com to make your reservation and payment for your favorite room, which attracts a discount rate. Please note, rooms are reserved based on first come, first serve. Fossvhotel experience the home of comfort. They come, they come.